Hello class, uh, forgive me if I talk fast, but uh, these videos don't allow for um, very long screen time for some reason. Uh, but I wanted to go over some of the poets and stuff, and so this is the Robert Frost lecture. Okay, so the thing you want to know about Robert Frost is, is uh, yes, he was a modernist, but he was still hanging on to some traditions of uh, regionalism, uh, especially his use of colloquial dialect, which means the way people talk, conversational poetry. And uh, he was uh, holding on to regionalism in terms of the, where his poems were set in New England and kind of created this kind of mythology, this idea that New England is the heart of America. And, um, you know, and so in other ways, though, he was very modernist. You know, he was breaking away from some of the older forms of poetry and trying out some new things, but yet still maintaining a strict structure or form. Now, what I mean by structure and form is, you know, if you've had 1102, you know that the way a poem is laid out on the page, you know, how many beats per syllable, you know, it's meter, you know, a meter is two syllables, you know, how, how, how many meter, you know, whatever the meter is, you know, iambic pentameter, meaning five meters, you know, quatrameter, four meters, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, rhyme schemes or blank verse, which is blank versus iambic pentameter. So it means, a, you know, a line of five meters, ten syllables uh, with no rhyme at the end. That's blank verse. But he would stretch that and he would use it to, you know, to be more conversational. Um, he was also very much in line with modernism in, in which he thought that the individual was more important than the collective. And if you committed too much time to the collective then, you know, the individual, it would take away from the individual. And this was a popular idea, like Philip Larkin believed that as well over there in England. But anyways, uh, but uh, Frost used very accessible language, meaning it was easy for everybody to understand. It was written the way we talk. It wasn't very, you know, fancy. Um, and uh, so his word choice or diction was clear and accessible. Um, he used, he tried to mimic speech patterns and he used very simple imagery that was easy to understand and often kind of a folksy uh, narrator. Um, this kind of made the poem seem like very easy, like he didn't work hard at them, but, you know, he did. Um, the Road Not Taken, I think, was in like its 128th draft version, you know, when it was finally published for, for good, for example. Uh, anyways, um, so... The modern, you know, modernists, you know, often believed or modernism kind of had very obscure, or difficult subject matter, whereas Frost went the other way. So he kind of departs from modernism right there. But he is a very rural, like modernists are, you know, kind of have a distaste for cities and modernism and uh, nature is what's important. So, you know, we do check that box for him as well. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? What else? Um, you know, sometimes, uh, okay, well, for instance, he has poems that fall into several categories, right? Let's, let's talk about it that way. Um, he has nature lyrics, which kind of describe or comment on a scene, you know, or event, uh, like stopping by the woods on a snowy evening or birches or after apple picking, then he has like dramatic narratives that tell the story about, you know, like terrible situations like the death of the hired man. And they often have some kind of philosophical, <clears throat> you know, idea too behind them. Um, and so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. Um, we're going to look at the mending wall uh, to start. All right. And this is a very straightforward poem about two neighbors that get together to rebuild the stone wall that separates their property. But, <clears throat> you know, this simple imagery has a lot more meaning, you know, in terms of modernism, you know, it has, you know, it's the idea of the individual versus the collective. Um, you know, there's also, you know, this kind of idea that, that, that barriers are healthy, you know, and so what, you know, so what does this have to do with what's going on in society? You know, have an influx of different, you know, immigrants from all over, from Ireland, Scotland, you know, Hungary, you know, Japan, China, you know, anywhere you can think of, there's people coming to the country. So is it a commentary on that? You know, Robert Frost was very kind of, he was, 
he wasn't like left or right, but he, he leaned towards conservatism. So, you know, but he made it very, he tried to stay out of politics. Uh, but anyways, um, this, this is a blank verse, but it does kind of vary the iambic pentameter to make it more conversational. It doesn't rely on rhyme. It relies on assonance and consonants to build rhythm. Um, you know, so alliteration is made up of assonance and consonants. You know, repeated vowel sounds, pretty consonant sounds. Uh, but it ultimately uses this to kind of push this idea of, you know, this kind of irony that these these two individuals are only coming together to kind of build a separation between them. And that's, you know, an interesting poem. And, and so, you know, you could put some political ramifications on it. But it's an important poem. There's plenty of resources where you can look at the sum, you know, the analysis of these things and, you know, of these poems. And, and but I just want kind of want to hit you on a real quick overview. Death of a Hard Man is a dramatic um, narrative. And if I had to say, I would say that the heart of this poem is kind of exploring some philosophical ideas uh, while simultaneously, you know, expressing the kind of the grief and troubles that, you know, that some people work and people and, and individuals go through in life and the tragedies we experience. But one thing that's interesting about this poem is <clears throat> you have Mary who has um, very immediate sympathies <coughs> for Silas. And she, um, you know, she sees Silas suffering and, you know, she feels bad for him immediately. And, and the narrator only hears of this secondhand. And he doesn't actually see Silas suffer, you know, um, Warren. Um, and, uh, and he kind of approaches it at more of a rational, logical point of view. You know, look, we got to get stuff done. This guy's hired. He's supposed to do a job. He's probably pulling one over, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it, it kind of, it's kind of like Frost is exploring these ideas of, of modernism about the individual versus the collective, you know, rational logic versus emotional, uh, spontaneous emotion, this, this natural. And um, that's a lot of what, what this poem is about and this poem explores. And so as you read it, you know, just, just, you know, keep a heads up about that. This is kind of an exploration about, you know, uh, about philosophical ideas and modernism, you know, at the time. Um, and besides that, it tells, you know, a straightforward narrative, you know, dramatic narrative. Um, also included after apple picking, because I'm trying to just get like a representative sample for you. But this, this poem is neat because it, it kind of, it goes between like, you know, it, it's supposed to be that moment falling asleep where you're putting your thoughts away and things are going from reality to dream world. And so because of that, he experiments uh, with form and it's very erratic. There's no, as you can see, there's, there's not the, the there's a, you know, some rhyme, but the, the lines are short and long and something, the meter's all crazy. The imagery comes at you kind of crazy. It's very regular verse to mimic those crazy thoughts while falling asleep. And it's all about the cycle of life and death. But this poem also, in a way, is an Ars Poetica, which is a, uh, you know, well, it's not really an Ars Poetica, but it explores the idea of the process of writing poetry and, and how it's it can be repetitious and how some of them are rotten apples. And and that's a lot of what this poem is about, is is, is about exploring the, the cycle of life and death and, and the process of poetry and writing and working and repetition and, you know, the pointlessness or the value of it all. Right. Um, Birches is one of my favorite poems by Robert Frost. And, and you guys might not be aware of this, but up North <coughs> have these birch trees are a little bit more common than down here. One of the things the kids and teenagers like to do is they climb up to the top of the birch tree and you hold the top, like the very top of the tree. And then you kind of, while holding the top, you push off the trunk with your feet and then you just grab on. And as you fall, the, the tree kind of curves outward and it bends and, and kind of makes like an arch, you know, like 
you know, like McDonald's, like an arch. And, and then you just kind of land on the ground kind of softly, the tree kind of lowering you down. But it ruins the tree. It leaves the tree bent over for the rest of its life. And um, so, you know, people fuss at teenagers about it. But this poem is interesting. And, and you know, the symbolism here, you know, as you can see it approaching the sun or the sky ascendance and going back down to earth reality is all about swinging back and forth between truth and imagination, reality and, and, and dream and fancifulness and, you know, maturity and immaturity and play and adulthood. And just like all these kind of, you know, these kind of different ideas that are going to come, these different philosophical ideas um, and, and kind of escaping earth for a while and then having to come back down and, you know, and ascending and, you know, and, and so that's, I don't know, that's, that's birches in a sense. Um, now the rest of the poems are pretty straightforward, you know, uh, nothing gold can stay is all about innocence lost. You know, that was made famous by the movie outsiders stopping by the woods on a snowy evening is all about <clears throat> the idea of one thing being, you know, versus other, you know, something else, this choice versus that choice. It's in quatrameter. It has four stanzas, you know, it has a, uh, you know, pretty steady rhyme scheme repetition. Um, but it's all about, you know, this choice versus that choice. I mean, these poems aren't complicated. And there's plenty of analysis online for them. But I thought I'd just run through those ideas of how it kind of meets ideas of modernism. And, and, and yet, you know, like with this poem, Birch is still kind of very regional. Same thing with apple picking. So, you know, Robert Frost kind of has has both of those characteristics. Well, I hope that was somewhat helpful. And if you're ever having trouble analyzing a poem, remember, just slow down. We, we read so fast with text messages and, and stuff like that that you don't think about what does this word mean next to this word and what does this phrase mean and what does each individual word mean. And, and you know, we just, you just remember, if you want to analyze a poem, just remember this. Why is this word there? What does this word do? Why did the author put it there? Like, how does it fit the point of the poem? Why is this phrase there? What does this phrase do? Why did the author put it there? Same thing, sentence, title, image, character, narrator, speaking voice, whatever it is, you can put that in that series of questions and your answer is analysis. <clears throat> Why is it there? How does it work? What is it supposed to do for the poem? Just answer those questions and you know of anything of the title of any word in the poem, punctuation, anything, and that's analysis.